everyone. Welcome to the Charvak Podcast. This is your host, Kushal Mehra. All right, today's podcast is unique. So let me give you guys a brief background. So we are obviously calling it Preparing for Defeat. Not so soon, Francis Fukuyama. Now, in case somebody wonders who the hell is Francis Fukuyama? Well, he's a very well-known thinker, uh, opinion maker, uh, intellectual in Western circles. He is known for many things. One of them was uh, the end of history hypothesis, which is which is uh, known as the most. But recently, in in a in a magazine or a essay form, it there's something called the American purpose, right? Now, over there, Francis Fukuyama had written a prediction piece. Like, it was 12 points, and it was called Preparing for Defeat, and he made 12 predictions. So, as always, Abhijit obviously read, tends to read all these things. It just happened to be the case that I also read it, and I DM'd Abhijit, Ki tune ye pada? and then I told Abhijit, I think we should respond to this. So, this podcast is very simple. I will read every point Francis Fukuyama makes and then Abhijit will respond to them. So on that note, Abhijit, welcome. Thank you, Vail, Vail, Vitri Vail and thanks for having me as always. Yes. Okay. So Abhijit, I'm going to read the first point now. So uh, to be fair to Francis Fukuyama, he starts by saying, I'll stick my neck out and make several prognostications. So this is Correct. number one. Yeah. Okay. So he says... Russia is heading for an outright defeat in Ukraine. Russian planning was incompetent based on a flawed assumption that Ukrainians were favorable to Russia and that their military would collapse immediately following an invasion. Russian soldiers were evidently carrying dress uniforms for their victory parade in Kiev rather than extra ammo and rations. Putin at this point has committed the bulk of his entire military to this operation. There are no vast reserves of forces he can call up to add to the battle. Russian troops are stuck outside various Ukrainian cities where they face huge supply problems and constant Ukrainian attacks. Just one more thing, Abhijit, so that everybody gets the full transparency. This was written on 10th March 2022. Now you can respond. Okay. Now, Fukuyama is both right and wrong here. And I'll tell you why. If you remember, there isn't a war that Russia has entered uh, unprepared. Okay, You look at what happened to them in World War I and World War II especially. Right. The thing is, people assume that Russia's preparations, plans and everything will remain static. Now, uh, you know... The thing is, let's make this point about, say, Intel failure. There's definitely incompetence, Intel failure, all of that. Uh, they did not see how Ukrainian troops had been trained up for the last eight years. They hadn't counted for the fact that, uh, you know, uh, the uh, missiles that Trump started decide to start sending the Ukrainians, uh, the Ukrainians would actually know how to use them. Uh, they didn't. Uh, they definitely thought Kiev was going to fall in a few days. I sure as hell thought so. The German internal assessment thought so. The French internal assessment thought so. Uh, the Israeli uh, internal assessment thought so. I did not know that till I went to Israel and they were stunned by what was happening. So, uh, so there was a lot happening in the background. Now, remember, Putin, like many dictators, would have a closed information loop just like Stalin did. Of course, in Stalin's time, it was a lot worse because he executed the entire admiralty. He executed most of the generals and everything before the war. So he was stuck with virtually nobody at the end of the war, uh, when the war started. Uh, here, assume everything that we've heard is right. And I can tell you from satellite imagery that uh, the logistics problems are absolutely real. Okay. Uh, uh, except... It's, it's not a problem of logistical supply. We saw the Russians ramp up their logistical supplies very quickly. The problem is they did so in a very foolish pattern, which was essentially, you know, painting, holding a red cloth in front of the bull, daring the Ukrainians to come attack them, which they did. Okay. Uh, second, uh, what they did not count on, which is happening, is that almost all international OSINT operators and publicly available satellite imagery, uh, 
Maxar, Planet Labs, the Korean one, Air Airbus. They are all now providing us with blurred images. All the classified images are now being given to the Ukrainians along with OSINT analysis on what to target, where to target, whom to target, how to target. Okay, so there's a global effort going on, global Intel effort. And remember, Intel wins wars. However, as bad as the Russian defeats are, and mind you, they've taken a lot of casualties. It's nowhere near the 10, 12,000 nonsense that you're hearing on uh, TV. But it is very okay. significant because a, a, our own estimate is about two to 3,000 dead, which is still a huge number of troops. That's a Bob huge man. number of attrition for uh, modern warfare. Okay. So uh, they are reformatting their plans. They are now working in a way that they were working in Syria. Remember, how long did it take them to stabilize Syria? Most of Syria, at least. It took them, what, four, five, six years to do that. And they will. So if you read what Boris Johnson, I mean, Boris Johnson didn't say it explicitly, but if you read his speech that he gave in Delhi two, three days back, what did he say? It's going to take a year or so, but Ukraine will be defeated and we're preparing for what's coming after that. Hmm. Right. So I don't think anybody's saying that Ukraine can win uh, seriously in private. In public, see, I don't go by public conversations, I, which, which is a lacuna. I'll admit it's a methodological lacuna. But I go more by private statements than public statements. And Russia is not suffering that defeat at all. Because if anything, if uh, Putin has read his Russian history well, mm -hmm. uh, Putin knows that he, if he loses, he will be replaced in no time. Any Russian leader who has ever lost a war or shown weakness during war has been removed like that within months. Okay. So uh, I just don't see it happening. All right. Now I'm going to read point number two. Point number two says the collapse of their position could be sudden and catastrophic Rather than happening slowly through a war of attrition, the army in the field will reach a point where it can neither be supplied nor withdrawn and morale will vape rise. This is at least true in the north. The Russians are doing better in the south, but those positions would be hard to maintain if the north collapses. Uh, no. See, when he wrote this, the north has since quote-unquote collapsed as per what... Uh, 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 they would have you believe it hasn't collapsed. We actually saw an ordered withdrawal. Uh, ordered withdrawals are not the sign of collapse. Collapse has exactly. a certain uh, blueprint. It has a certain, there are certain markers of collapse that you know, uh, which were not happening. Because if you notice, when, once the Russians would withdraw some from somewhere, the Ukrainians would take at least two, three days to even come into territory that had been vacated. That is not the sign of a collapse. A collapse is where you're encircling and taking prisoners of war and so on and so forth. Uh, what they are doing is, remember, uh, right now they are focused though on the east, specifically Mariupol. They are focused on all the Russian majority areas, most of which they've already captured. Uh, Mariupol is uh, curious because in Azovstal, the uh, Azov uh, uh, steel uh, plant, what's happening is the Azovs have uh, basically again used human shields. They've got a lot of Russian kids because Mariupol is an overwhelmingly Russian city. Uh, they've got a lot of Russian women, children, kids all holed up there. So they're taking their own sweet time with the siege uh, in the hope that the Azovs will surrender because the Azovs are really nasty characters. They're essentially Nazis, right? So they're waiting for that to happen. Uh, then what you see, I think, uh, will be very nasty. Because the Russians aren't going to, I suspect, the Russians aren't going to hold back after that. We saw a pattern of fighting here that we had not seen in Syria. Okay, uh, uh, In Syria, they were very unrestricted in what they bombed, where they bombed, and things like that. I know it. it you're going, Abhijit, we've all seen the photos. That's the stupidest thing you've ever said. <laughs> Remember, this is Russia we're talking about. So collateral damage and... Uh, has a very different connotation from the West's notion of collateral damage, right? So uh, it, it is going to get nastier and nastier. But no, I don't... Uh, uh, 
again, I think he's already been proven wrong on that. And it's it's not going to end. Soon, there is going to be no collapse. Okay, this point three, to I genuinely am confused ki unho ne ye point likha bhi kaise hai, to be very honest. So, I mean, jo hai. there is no diplomatic solution to the war possible prior to this happening. What love, jo point two hua hai. There is no conceivable compromise that would be acceptable to both Russia and Ukraine given the losses they have taken at this point. I, I don't understand this point at all. Right. So, this is uh, the classic Western line that uh, they've generally used, that we need to be winning before we negotiate terms. So if you look, if you read Henry Kissinger's The White House Years and things like that, when he was uh, sort of micromanaging the Israeli war, uh, the Yom Kippur war, uh, the Israelis would keep asking the Americans for a veto till such point as they had gained the upper hand so that the negotiations would be favorable. Now, the problem here is we have to ask ourselves, where is the negotiation turning favorable for, uh, where is the military situation turning favorable for the Ukrainians? It's not. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of wishful thinking happening ki tomorrow, tomorrow, tomorrow it's going to change. Uh, it's really not going to change. Remember what happened in northern uh, Ukraine was the Russians withdrew. You did not defeat them, they withdrew. Okay, you it, caused, I mean, you caused... It, why did they withdraw? Uh, just for the information, why did they lost interest in that area? No, remember, they withdrew when... Uh, uh, they haven't lost interest. They're coming back. They're coming back from multiple prongs, uh, including from the Belarusian border. But uh, uh, what happened was, one was definitely the attrition. The second was the fact that they'd completed their cauldrons. That is the uh, northern... In the east, the northern and the southern front had met up. They had completed encirclement of Mariupol. And Mariupol was target number one. We finished that. Then we look after the rest. So what had been done, it turns out, was your classic strategic feint. You give them the impression that you're fighting on two fronts, the north and the east. So Ukraine bogs down a lot of its forces in the north, in Kiev, and deprives the local area of uh, uh, troops and ammunition and armor and things like that. So that was classically what happened. It worked. Mariupol is now completely cut off and it's besieged. Uh, you will see these tactics being repeated. Remember, it's very difficult to predict where it's going. If it was easy to predict, then it wouldn't be a military tactic. Then, you're, then you'd know exactly what the enemy is doing, right? Uh, but definitely, they, they, it's not like the Russia hasn't suffered badly. Huh? They, they overestimated vastly. Mm -hmm. But when we come to negotiations, is me negotiation ka kya problem hai? From people that I know were involved in the negotiations, there is no willingness to negotiate from the Ukrainians. Apparently, a lot of the Ukrainians want to negotiate, which is why two or three of the Ukrainian negotiators were killed. Do you remember that? They were taken out and they were shot. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, it's, been a month it's been a month uh, or so. No? It's been a month. Uh, they were tortured and shot, apparently. Hmm. So what's been happening is that uh, you have this great incoherence coming on the Ukrainian side as well, where they are hoping that tomorrow will be different and holding out. It's a good thing and a bad thing. Militarily, it's a good thing because then your troops' morale remains very high. The problem is what happens to the people on the ground. Because the Russian negotiators, I don't know the Ukrainian negotiators. I know some of the Turks. Uh, their thing almost uniformly has been that they don't seem to treat the negotiations seriously. They change tack during negotiations which is why Putin isn't even interested in negotiations anymore. Hmm. Remember, what, what are... Putin has said, I don't want to negotiate. When Zelensky has said he wants a face-to-face -face meeting to sort this out. Hmm. So I guess Zelensky is screwed.
Totally, I guess. Well, not point no, number four. See, Zelensky is not screwed. He's going to go off to Poland or something. I don't know if he's already in Poland, if he goes to and fro. If you look at the movement of Western leaders in and out of Kiev, uh, do you get the impression that uh, Russia is targeting anything? I mean, even when Kiev was surrounded, you had the Estonian, Polish and all these people going into Kiev, right? So... He, he basically he can travel quite freely as I see it. Have you noticed his videos? They're specky. It's always like he's uh, doing it on a green screen. Have you noticed that? Some, some, not all. Uh, uh, he, he's almost certainly now, there was surely a time when he was across the border, uh, first to Lviv and then somewhere else. But then there seems to be a there, there are videos where he's back in Kiev. So we can't really tell what's happening out there. Okay. All right. This number four is pretty easy. I think everyone will agree. Point number four is the United Nations Security Council has proven once again to be useless. <laughs> the only helpful thing was the General Assembly vote, which helps to identify the words bad or prevaricating actors. Interesting. The second part is interesting. The first part is not interesting. Hmm. Well, it's an American point of view. It's an opinion. What can we do about that? Uh, because remember, if you look at the population terms, uh, the uh, chaps who either abstained or voted against were 56% of the world's population. Mm. Right. So it's very curious that people who claim that Hillary Clinton's election was stolen from her because she won the popular vote, but uh, Trump won the electoral college, then come and tell you that, you know, uh, uh, in the U in the UN, it's the electoral college that counts and not the popular vote that counts. Yeah. Okay. Point five is interesting. Um, point five says the Biden administration's decisions not to declare a no-fly zone or help transfer Polish MIGs were both good ones. They've kept their heads during a very emotional time. It is much better to have the Ukrainians defeat the Russians on their own depriving Moscow of the excuse that NATO attacked them, as well as avoiding all the obvious escalatory possibilities. The Polish MiGs in particular would not add much to Ukrainian capabilities. Much more important is a continuing supply of javelins, stingers, TB2s, medical supplies, comms equipment, and intel sharing. I assume the Ukrainian forces are already being vectored by NATO intelligence operating from outside Ukraine. 100%. Like I said, I've told you about the OSINT. I'm only involved with the OSINT community. So I can tell you 100% of the international OSINT community has been mobilized to support Ukraine. And it is live. It is real-time support to the Ukrainians. Like there are friends of mine who are literally, they will be giving the information to the Ukrainians in the R saying they've checked the area. It's sanitized. There are 10 Russian tanks there. Go blow them up. And they will go there with those uh, 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 stingers for air cover with the javelins for uh, anti-tank and they will go blow them up. So that is 100% accurate. The thing is, this is where modern warfare is. You can actually win, uh, well, you can wage a fantastic guerrilla campaign. You can defeat armor, you can defeat uh, 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 aircraft very uh, 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 well, uh, and you know, this is one of the things, uh, this isn't new. If you remember, there was that famous video of Turkish uh, leopard tanks. Uh, I mean, the leopards are considered the uh, gold standard of tank making. German tanks given to Turkey, which had gone into northern uh, Syria, and they were destroyed by ISIS within like seconds. They, they hadn't even gotten one kilometer into Syria, and they were destroyed. Mm. So remember... The anti-tank weapons and anti-aircraft weapons today are extremely deadly. Uh, they are extremely accurate. Uh, and unless you have the kind of standoff capabilities that NATO invests heavily in, you will have to get within firing range of those missiles and you will be shot. Uh, this is something the Russians are learning. They should have learned this from Grozny, where their tanks got massacred in the first battle of Grozny. They did not. Uh, they still have not, but now they finally have because they're going in for infantry supported by artillery. And the moment uh, 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 the uh, well, the Ukrainian campaign is an infantry campaign. 
So what happens is that it's basically infantry on infantry that we are going to see from now on. Not so much armor, but there is going to be air power and Russia is going to use a lot of it. It's going to lose a lot of it. Hmm. All right. Now we get into point six. The cost that Ukraine is paying is enormous, of course. But the greatest damage is being done by rockets and artillery, which neither MiGs nor a no-fly zone can do much about. The only thing that will stop the slaughter is defeat of the Russian army on the ground. I mean, is he serious? He's making that claim for Ukraine? Well, technically, he's right. Russia needs to stop the uh, uh, invasion for the death to uh, for the death to stop. Uh, the problem is, what is the cost of that kind yeah, of a defeat? That's exactly because what I was hinting at. So, so here's the thing. About the, the sad thing about guerrilla warfare is you can have two kinds of guerrilla warfare. One is where you are taking these troops into uh, the countryside and defeating them out there. Or you're using guerrilla warfare plus urban warfare, which is a completely different beast where you're turning your cities into traps, where you're essentially using human shields. So, you know, the entire thing, now look, you can't go tell the Ukrainians you can't defend yourself any way you see fit. But the problem is the Ukrainians are, their entire defense is based on human shields, through and through. It's based on using their humans as collateral, uh, as PR collateral, as well as a military uh, advantage, which it is. Hmm. All right. Okay, I think you've answered this, but I'm going to read point seven. Putin will not survive the defeat of his army. He gets support because he's perceived to be a strong man. What does he have to offer once he demonstrates incompetence and is stripped of his coercive power? Because assumption well, is I Putin don't... will be defeated. Yeah. Uh, so, look, Putin is incompetent. There's no doubt about it. You know, when he went into Syria, he actually thought his his international intel was so bad. He genuinely believed that the world would thank him for going into stabilized Syria. He didn't realize Europe especially would have such a negative reaction to it. And he was surprised. And you'd reckon a man in that position would then re-evaluate uh, the intel sources and the entire structure of intel provided to him. He did not. So Putin does go in for a lot of wishful thinking and things like that. However, uh, he knows he cannot afford to lose. Mm. Okay. And the Russian population, you tell me, when would a Russian population, have you ever heard of a Russian popular revolt in the middle of a war? Are Hindustan mein nahi hua hai, when the... Uh, 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 DMK was uh, advocating Tamil separatism. Uh, the Chinese actually thought that uh, 62 would destroy the Indian Union. It did the exact reverse. It strengthened the Indian Union because the DMK had to drop the separatism platform in the election after that. Because if they talked about separatism, they would have been voted out with a huge bloody uh, 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 defeat. So I don't know why people think that the Russian morale is going to collapse so rapidly. This is a country that took, what, 20, 26 million dead in World War II. It took a few million dead in World War I. Uh, it took a heck of a lot of uh, deaths in, uh, in Chechnya, in uh, uh, Afghanistan, in Syria. Do you see a collapse of morale? Iran has suffered a huge number of deaths in uh, uh, Syria. Do you see a collapse of morale? I don't know where this thinking comes from. Uh, maybe it's from Iraq, where, you know, once uh, things happened, there was a general collapse of morale and a, a retreat, a disordered retreat. But uh, some of this is just clear wishful thinking. It's also under the a priori assumption that nationalism is out of fashion. It may be out of fashion in the Western, quote-unquote, Anglosphere. Yeah. Not, another no, part not of in the Russia. Russia. Not in Russia, not in Asia, not in Africa, not in South America. Though South America yeah. has a very subdued kind of nationalism, but uh, yeah, not going out of fashion anywhere else. 
yeah so it's 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 that assumption i think okay this this eight point point number eight is the invasion has already done huge damage to populists all over the world who prior to the attack uniformly expressed sympathy to for putin that includes matteo salvini Jair bolsonaro Zemmour, Eric Zemmour, Marine Le Pen, Viktor Orban, and of course, Donald Trump. The politics of war has exposed their openly authoritarian leanings. Where does this come from? Marine lost the election, but she won more votes than before. Significantly yeah. more votes than before. 41% of the vote. Uh, so, <laughs> I don't know. Viktor Orban won a landslide election, and he was the most blatantly pro-Putin of the entire lot. After winning, he actually came and called out Zelensky as the enemy. Literally, mm. he called Zelensky the enemy in his speech. Jair Bolsonaro, I don't see him going anywhere anytime soon. Uh, who, who, who are the other ones? Okay. Bolsonaro, tha, Eric Zemmour, tha, Victor Orban, Donald Trump, Zemmour, Matteo Salvini. Look, Zemmour, I never, uh, Matteo Salvini, this is Italy, right? Italy has had more governments than it has had Christmases. So it's impossible to predict. No, it's true. It's actually true. If you actually go through the number of governments, they've actually had more governments than they have Christmases. Uh, but uh, look, uh, so Italy, I can't talk much about, but uh, uh, Zemur was out in the first round. I knew Zemur wasn't going to do very well. Uh, he was an interesting character, but he was never going to do very well. I didn't think he was going to ever notch up to Marine Le Pen. Yeah. But all again, right, so, wishful thinking. Yeah. All right, this. all right. I think what he doesn't get is that leftism is always global, but nationalism is always local. It is determined on local factors. It has always been. This is why you have a global left, but you don't have a global right. Right. Because also, yeah, because it's based on your local identity and religious identity. And it exactly. will have so many I mean, differences. He, let me give you a simple example. Poland and Hungary, they both have right-wing governments. They both hate the EU. Uh, Poland has passed some of the most restrictive laws on abortion and homosexuality and whatnot. Uh, yet, they're the most virulently anti-Russian. Hungary, on the other hand, has not passed any of this. Uh, well, I mean, there's a few here and there, but they're nowhere near as virulent as the Poles against uh, 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 all of this. But they're quite happily semi, they're not openly pro-Russian, they're openly anti-Russian, but it's a kind of a wink-wink, nudge-nudge anti-Russianism. So see, even within the right, there is no uniformity out here within Europe, within the same, within two neighboring countries, the size of Uttar Pradesh uh, geographically. Mm. So he's making these huge assumptions when he should know. He, of all people, should know the right is not global. It is extremely localized. It's hyper-localized. Well, this is why I wanted to cover this uh, this 12-point prediction and uh, let the world know how many times these people make these predictions and how many times they go wrong. To be fair, Francis is a very good predictor. He got it. I think he gets such a bad rap for the end of history. It's... Uh, <laughs> Well, look, I mean, that's so unfair, right? Uh, unfortunately, the guy got pilloried for it. Uh, I know him. I mean, I know him personally. He's he's actually dead sharp and really smart. I have no I doubt about think... it. I like him, actually. I like his books also. I've read him. Yeah, but uh, he gets... Uh, remember, he if, if Putin suffers from an echo chamber, Western academics also suffer from an echo chamber that they live in. Right? Uh, it, it depends on what you're hearing, how what you're saturated with, etc, etc, etc. So it is what it is. But yeah, next. Yeah. All right. Point number nine. The war to this point, and this point is obviously 10th of March, he's written it this, so I'll be fair to him over here. The war to this point has been a good lesson for China. Like Russia, China has built up seemingly high-tech military forces in the past decade, but they have no combat experience. The miserable performance of the Russian Air Force would likely be replicated by the People's Liberation Army Air Force, which similarly has no experience managing complex air operations. We may hope that the Chinese leadership will not delude itself as to its own capabilities the way Russians did when contemplating a future move against Taiwan. 
Mm. Yes and no. And I'll tell you why. The Chinese have invested very heavily in high tech. Uh, also, uh, because they've invested in high tech, they think they are way ahead of the Russians in certain areas. Uh, certainly in terms of communications, they think they are ahead. They probably are given the uh, uh, debacles that happened with Russian comms equipment in Ukraine. Uh, they will, however, be watching the supremacy of even basic level Western equipment. Okay, And this is a lesson that India probably should learn, but we do not. Because if you remember, there was a ridiculous piece where the defense spokesperson came out and said Russian equipment is cheaper. Well, it's cheaper because, you know, it doesn't really work very well. Uh, this is why we use the Mirage 2000 in Balakot, not the Sukhoi, even though ostensibly the Sukhoi was procured precisely for that particular role. Uh, we were given all this hogwash that it was going to go 3,000 kilometers and bomb Beijing. You couldn't even use it to go in 80, 90 kilometers or 100 odd kilometers and bomb Balakot. You had to use the Mirage 2000 for it. Okay. Mm. So... Russian equipment is crap. So here's the problem. If India hasn't drawn these lessons about Russian equipment, being a relatively open country, how do you think China, which is a much more closed loop, and especially under Xi Jinping, it's become a worse closed loop. Uh, they're not listening. I mean, all that there's not one section of their economy that is not on tenterhooks. Uh, trains debacle, high-speed rail, debacle, uh, construction, debacle, infrastructure, debacle, international uh, 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 developmental aid, Sri Lanka, Pakistan, in your face, debacles. Uh, why do you think they are going to understand these lessons? If anything, they might draw the exact opposite lesson, which is that the technological leap will grow, and therefore, if we want to capture Taiwan, we better do it now. Interesting. All right. Point number 10. Now, this is um, very interesting because you literally ended with Taiwan. And point number 10 is about Taiwan. He says, hopefully, Taiwan itself will wake up as to the need to prepare to fight as the Ukrainians have done and restore conscription. Let's not be prematurely defeatist. Yeah, this is a very important point. See, I think... Uh, you know, Taiwan has its own version of the DRDO, which is almost as destructive as the DRDO. Her cheese me, they come up and say, hum banayenge, hum banayenge, hum banayenge, we'll make it. And they don't deliver. Uh, people don't realize this about Taiwan. So Taiwan has to take some very close, hard decisions. There was a fabulous paper by uh, CSBA, the Center for uh, Budgetary uh, Security Analysis or something like that by this Indian-French guy. What's his name? I forget. Indian-French Muslim guy. He's a very good scholar. Uh, something Rahman. Uh, and they had done this whole thing on how, and this was done almost 10 years back, focusing on how Taiwan was investing in a lot of capital, in big ships, and big things which they should not, what they should in, instead be investing in is a lot of aircraft, number one, and a submarine-based deterrence force to keep sinking those boats even before they reached. So it was a very good asymmetric analysis of what Taiwan needed to do. Uh, I don't think Taiwan has taken it on board. So I think the Taiwanese will actually be making some very... I, I think you'll see a lot more Taiwanese introspection than you'll see Chinese introspection. Fair enough. All right. Point number 11 is Turkish drones will become bestsellers. <laughs> I have no idea. This is your zone, please. Yeah, well, they will. Because remember, weaponized drones are, uh, first of all, uh, apparently weaponized drones come under the MTCR interpretations. Nobody actually applies it, but they do. Uh, in this particular case, after Azerbaijan's victory over Armenia and after uh, uh, well, the publicity they've gained, what nobody's talking about is all those drones keep getting shot down very, very rapidly. Okay. Uh, they've only so far been used in a low technology environment or a low electronic warfare environment. Uh, we know this. Why? Because clearly the Russians aren't using jamming because what happens ends up happening out there is that uh, 
the if the Russians were jamming, you wouldn't be getting any of the video or the signals or anything. You remember how Russian troops own comms equipment didn't work and they had to use the local 4G uh, network to communicate with each other. Compare this to when I think it was either a German or a Dutch frigate landed up to the north of Israel during the 2006 uh, 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 Israeli campaign against Hezbollah. The radar when it on that ship when it was turned on literally conked off communications in thousands of homes in northern Israel and southern Lebanon. Okay, so. Uh, these drones will operate fine in an electro in a non-electronically dense battle space. They'll be very successful, for example, against the Indian military. If I were Pakistani, I would buy three, four hundred of these drones uh, just to go on taking out Indian military targets. Uh, mm. I can honestly tell you they'd slaughter our uh, 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 armored divisions, cold start or no cold start. So, uh, and uh, so, uh, this is a no-brainer that Turkish drones are going to be a big seller. Mm. Okay. Now we go to the last and final point. I mean, a Russian defeat will make possible a, quote, new birth of freedom and get us out of our funk about the declining state of global democracy. The spirit of 1989 will live on thanks to a bunch of brave Ukrainians. Unfortunately, he's going back to the uh, end of uh, history hypothesis. Yeah. Uh, yeah, not happening, boss. If anything, it's opened up so much more. You're going to see a fracturing of the global economic hole. You're going to see a fracturing of the global financial hole. Uh, you're going to see a fracturing of uh, uh, interests. Uh, the world isn't going back to what it was before this, but not in a way Francis Yu Fukuyama thought possible. Because remember, what is the worst that is going to happen to Russia? Russia is essentially now going to become a Chinese satellite. China loves these, uh, uh, you know, these uh, uh, what I call free radicals, countries like North Korea or Pakistan, which are extremely high risk accepting, uh, extremely mm. revisionist, uh, that bog down entire areas. So, you know, Japan and South Korea can't really do much as long as they've got North Korea in their backyard. India can't really do much as long as it's got Pakistan in its backyard. Mm -hmm. So what ends up happening is what really can Europe do with Russia in its backyard, defeat or no defeat? Mm -hmm. Right. Russia is now threat number one. Uh, and, and if you look at it, China should be the bigger threat. Uh, China is the cancer that's going to kill you in six months. Uh, but Pakistan is our hemorrhoid that keeps hurting our ass every single day. That takes up hmm. all our attention. It's like yeah. that for Europe. China is the long-term threat, but Russia is the immediate in-your-face hemorrhoid that's causing you such a butt ache at the moment, hmm. which you need to deal with. So you will keep getting bogged down in the tactical and keep losing sight of the strategic. Uh, so I don't think Francis has thought this through very well. Hmm. All right. So now we've covered the points. Now we'll start taking the viewers' questions. So uh, obviously they can't be just about Russia and Ukraine because there are many questions. That there are also about how should India react to it or what will happen to India vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, because it's such a, a cluster fuck, as they say, this entire thing. So someone has asked, what does Abhijit make of Venugopal Narayanan's five-part series on Swaraj very makes the case that the US wanted this war in order to displace Russia as the primary energy supplier to the EU. Is this also related to the fact that dollar supremacy is weakening? Uh, look, a lot of it is conspiracy theory, but unfortunately, as we've realized during COVID, uh, what you call conspiracy theory ends up being fact tomorrow. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Alas, I, I never believed in conspiracy theories. But I can tell you that uh, there was definitely a concerted effort, and this is even private conversations with Americans, American members in government, that they never wanted Russia joining NATO. Uh, they never wanted, uh, uh, and most of it had to do with Russia being too big and too powerful and too resourceful a country 
to be providing an alternate pole to uh, America in NATO. Okay, and for them, the nightmare always was a German-Russian axis within NATO, which would, uh, with German uh, Germany's economic power and industry combined with Russia's resources and manpower, that was not something that they would be willing to tolerate. And the problem for a long time was that Silvio Berlusconi had kind of tried to make it a triangle, a sort of uh, a, a Berlin, Rome, uh, a, a Moscow triangle kind of thing, which. Uh, uh, I would encourage you just to go through Munich Security Conference lectures. When Berlusconi was in power, it suddenly became a new topic, corruption. How corruption uh, 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 destroys Western policy and unity. Of course, all the people talking on stage with the year I attended the Munich Security Conference were all board directors in Chinese companies receiving huge amounts of money from China. But that wasn't corruption. Only receiving money from Russia was corruption. Okay. Uh, and, yeah. And, of course, this was the year that uh, 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 Russia had annexed uh, Crimea. Uh, so... <coughs> uh, there has been a lot of narratives and things like that. Now, did they openly want war? No. Uh, did they want to snatch Ukraine away in a calculated manner? Did they want to destroy Russia's backyard? Yes. Uh, a lot of Americans would tell you that in private. A lot of Russians would tell you the belief in that in private without any facts. All right. Okay, now the next viewer question is, again, so how they're looking at it is they're looking at the Russia-Ukraine crisis. So what the person has said is that Germany has increased its defense budget, right? Uh, in lieu of this entire Russia-Ukraine crisis. Significant. Now, yeah. yeah. So do you think there is an opportunity for Indian defense manufacturers to seek some potential joint ventures considering that? Or can we do it, I guess, is the question they're trying to ask. Theoretically, all of these are opportunities. Theoretically, when the Australians cancelled the uh, French submarine contract, we should have gone and bought 50% of DCNS and Areva. And we've always wanted a Western single hull nuclear submarine design. It should have been done then and there. We did not. Technically, when Victoria Newland came to Delhi and said, we want to help you uh, diversify your... Uh, weapon supplies, we should have said, congratulations, thank you very much. We want to get rid of our Sukhois and our MiG-29s, but we also want to get rid of all our old equipment, the Jaguars and things. So how about you give us uh, uh, a three, 400 F-16s and F-15s on a uh, 15, 20-year lease at rock bottom prices, which you absorb as diversification costs. It, it's it's mm. a part of your cost towards containment of Russia. We should have done that. You know, when, when somebody comes with an offer like that, you stump them and say, yeah, okay, good, do it. And you authorize the transfer of uh, 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 French uh, nuclear submarine technology to us without creating too much of a hullabaloo about it. Okay, mm. uh, show us you're serious by giving us engines. Till today, engines went on the table because you went on saying, uh, you know, there's too much uh, OPSEC, uh, operational security issues, and too much this thing with uh, uh, Russian equipment. We'll do it, but give us the engines. Uh, give us the way of manufacturing it. Hmm. We don't. See, we never lose an opportunity to lose an opportunity. Hmm. And I suspect, given our own industrial, our toxic bureaucratic industrial ecosystem, which has actually gone worse under Modi in a sense in DRDO. I mean, look at the guy who's become the principal scientific advisor. Satish Reddy is unique in that he hasn't presided over a single project that has ever delivered. Not one. Not one. Uh, so it's, uh, uh, you know, it's... Uh, it's there is a lot we can do, but there's nothing that we will do. All right. So... Okay, this is a very specific question about the, the conflict itself. Do you expect Russians to go towards Odessa? Yes, I do. I think the next battle is going to be for Odessa. After the Donbass is pacified, the next big battle is going to be for Odessa. Uh, I think the battle for Odessa will be much bigger than the battle for Kiev. Uh, we should also be asking ourselves, 
since all the damage is being caused by Western equipment coming in, why aren't they going in from Belarus and cutting off the Western border? That should have been their first priority on day one. At least not on day one, but by day three, day four, when they knew that Kiev hadn't fallen. There are a lot of things that they're doing that are quite inexplicable. But remember, there's one thing, there, there's only one rule of war, you never invade Russia. And the second rule of war is you never underestimate the Russians. Never, ever do it. Anybody who has underestimated the Russians has paid a heavy price for it. Hmm. All right. So I'm going to take the Russian questions first, which are specifically to Russia, Ukraine, and then come to the Indian angle to it. Okay. How depleted will the Russians be after this is over? Are they relevant today only because of the nuclear threat? Look, Russia is relevant for a whole set of reasons that have uh, more to do than just the nuclear angle to all of this. Uh, let me give you a simple example. It's minerals. Uh, you know, industrial diamonds overwhelmingly. Je jewel diamonds come from Africa, uh, South Africa, Namibia, all those places, Botswana. But uh, uh, industrial diamonds overwhelmingly come from Russia. Okay, there are too many things that come out of Russia. Russia is a bread basket. Russia is a fertilizer basket. It's not a single product economy, but it is a commodities economy. Uh, so there is just too much around. What are you going to do if, uh, for example, Russia keeps vetoing things in the Security Council with an Iran nuclear deal, for example? What are you going to do? Hmm? Uh, mm -hmm. And Iran doesn't seem to be any in any mood to compromise. If anything, the Iranians have become a lot harder in their negotiations since this whole thing started up for one very simple reason. They said, Ki, you know, when we were in a weak negotiating position, you were pushing hard terms. Now you require our help against Russia in some form or another, and we're not going to give it to you. We're going to extract our pound of flesh. Mm -hmm. Right? So it's... Uh, yeah. Okay. This is about Ukraine. Who is going to foot the bill for rebuilding Ukraine? I mean, their industries, public infrastructure, etc. I mean, in many areas is completely shattered. So you think the West will pick up the bill? Look, Ukraine was already moving towards deindustrialization. Its per capita income was already one third of Russia's. Hmm. You know, so you keep looking at all this Ukrainian propaganda on how poor Russians are invading rich, rich Ukraine. <laughs> you look at the economic figures, you're like, dude, you're $3,300. You're only slightly richer than India. And you're talking about a country with a per capita income of around $10,000. Hmm. I mean, you know, this is like saying uh, China is going to invade India because China envies our standard of living. So remember, Ukraine was already very, very severely damaged. Okay, And it was part of a program. Remember, part of this Ukrainian nationalism was to shift. You remember, we did that program on Ukraine. We were discussing it. It was mm -hmm. the industrialized Russian East that provided most of the GDP with trade with Russia. Because it was linked. It was uh, uh, linked into the Russian economy. The West of Ukraine has not industrialized. It is overwhelmingly agrarian. Mm. And they wanted to impoverish the East so that most of the economic activity would shift to the West and it would be linked to the European economy. Mm. So now the bill for reconstructing Ukraine is going to be insane. Where is this surplus money going to come from? Remember, American... Uh, uh, America's economy, uh, uh, the, the backup for the economy is the debt. It is no longer pegged to a gold reserve. It is pegged to debt. Hmm. Okay. You're going to need about five, six hundred billion dollars to rebuild Ukraine to a so-called European standard if you want to integrate it into Europe. Where is that going to happen? Are the Russians even going to let you do it? Because remember, they need to do nothing. All they need to say, every time you set up a new factory, they send two caliber cruise missiles and boom. Hmm. Okay. Now, now uh, questions which are actually about India, but keeping these things in mind. Um, based on what you have shared, uh, in the event of the next Indo-Pak conflict, 
India will face massive opposition from Pakistani military. And in case of China, could it be a 62 repeat? I guess uh, he heard you all this time and that's why he's asking this question. Hmm. Yeah, this is what we've been... Look, I mean, I've been called Lockheed Martin ka dalla, Boeing ka dalla, uh, America ka dalla, France ka dalla, Sweden ka dalla, whatever. How long have I been telling you Russian equipment is shit? Kushal, you tell me. Since I've known you, haven't I been saying Russian equipment is shit? Four five years to have Four five years to have As far as I remember, it's been about ten years. You don't want to diversify. Instead, your excuses, but Russian equipment is cheap. No, this is like buying cheap condoms that are going to leak, and then you're going to end up with a baby, and the cost of raising the baby is going to be much more than the cost of buying condoms. Mm. Oh, good condoms. Okay, so. This is basically what you're looking at. We want to keep buying tanks. You know, it, have, there was a fantastic, uh, you know, Kesari Dhwaj on Twitter. His name is Rohit Vats. He wrote a fantastic, very prescient piece on how Pakistan had built up its arsenal of shoulder-fired anti-aircraft and especially shoulder-fired anti-tank missiles. Mm. And you did not take that into consideration at you went on building up your tank arsenal. Mm. Okay. Uh, what do you do? Honestly, what do you do with things like this? Because, you know, tanks are not that mobile. If you go in for the way the French went into uh, North Africa with highly mobile jeeps and things like that, which, you know, uh, uh, those shoulder-fired missiles, they're wire-controlled and things like that. So, you know, mm. they can't really do that kind of terminal maneuvering required for hitting a fast-moving jeep that's zigzagging crazy kind of thing, right? Mm -hmm. uh, this used to incidentally be the Israeli tactic of dealing with Russian anti-ship missiles. So when the Russian anti-ship mm -hmm. missile was fired, first, the first thing the Israelis did when in the 60, uh, uh, 67 war their destroyer got sunk, they shifted entirely to small, fast ships. And what they do is the moment a Russian missile was fired at you, they would actually charge the missile Mm -hmm. Head on, firing countermeasures off one side of the ship. So what the radar of the missile would see is, I mean, if imagine this, this is the missile's radar, and Abhijit's face is the ship. Okay, uh, what I'm doing is I'm firing countermeasures on this side completely. So what happens is the missile, which is looking at me like this, now thinks this is the center of the ship. Ah. Distraction. You're, you're creating a false radar image. Mm. So it would go right through. And why the front of the ship? Because the front of the ship presented the shortest possible radar image. The side of a ship is much bigger than the front of a ship. Mm. So, you know, there are lots of things you can do to defray that investment in shoulder-fired equipment can be defrayed. It's still going to be very expensive, but you can defray it very decently but we don't focus on that we focus on all kinds of crap there's hmm. nothing we can do it is what it is this is india we are indians only <laughs> um i guess the next question you have answered yourself i mean it, the question was is there a lesson for india in all of this will fo switching focus to smarter better integrated systems help us to counter the volumes or scale of Chinese weapons? I guess you just answered it already in answering the previous question. So yeah, so th that that was answered indirectly. Yeah, they, yeah, both interesting question. Tha. What are the lessons India needs to learn to prevent a Taiwan invasion from China or China invading anywhere? I mean, this is assuming that India is going to be a global player, by the way. we Look, we can only deter a Chinese invasion of India. Our not that we can deter China invading anywhere else. Let's get that very clear. Despite all our delusions. <laughs> so, so I guess all said and done, China means it's superpower, whether we like it or not. And they'll be number one. Well, I'm not too sure. I'm not You're too not sure. You're not sure about that. Uh, because remember, whatever problems America is going through, America's decline will be slower than China's pent up problems with the infrastructure, with uh, 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 foreign aid, with everything. 
so i'm you're looking at a period of two declining powers where china will actually be in much greater vulnerability though it will not be seen to be declining i mean let's be realistic boss their per capita income is about $11000 america's per capita income is about 50 60000 per capita 60000 yeah so what are you comparing in terms of the science and infrastructure and things like that hmm uh I personally think this is like the Byzantine uh, uh Persian conflict where the sudden uh, the Arabs and the Turks become the greatest beneficiaries of that and they become the new superpower. And you know what is interesting is most people don't realize the rate at which China is becoming buddha. They are becoming old. Yeah. yeah. In fact their the speed has become faster than America because America mein fresh in immigration hoti rehti hai. You know the world still wants to go to the Americans. and the chinese are doing something see to prevent their own economy from going into the information phase from the manufacturing phase they are preventing services from taking off because they want to maintain the manufacturing base they also determine ki education unlike america where everybody could determine where their money went to in scientific research the chinese focus their research here 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 now education is a very complex especially science education is a very complex ecosystem where you never know what ends up making the biggest strides so for example touch screens quantum physics which uh, you know niels bohr died trying to convince einstein of its utility but einstein was considered it was hogwash and yet it is that niels bohr quantum physics that helps you with all your touch screen applications and things which have revolutionized things they've also revolutionized warfare because your uh, uh before in order to fire a missile you would have to you know uh, uh take it uh, uh, take a mouse uh click the cursor onto the uh, plane and this when your plane is itself maneuvering you have to do all of that and then you have to press the button and fire the missile so it will know which quadrant to go into here you just ta boom done it's reduced your shoot to sensor time by something like 10 12 seconds which is in war it's the difference between life and death hmm all right so uh again, this is a very specific question again uh, uh the russians are talking about taking the war beyond ukraine into moldova specifically Transnistria Lukashenko they had a map do you think they will go ahead and do that considering how hard things are in Ukraine personally i don't think so personally i don't think so but again yeah putin uh, ka kuch pata nahi yeah to predict okay was sundar ji the last visionary in ia forces who are the current visionaries that can learn the lessons of the russo ukraine war Well, I'm not seeing any great visionaries in the Indian military anymore. Um uh, Sundar ji was a visionary. Uh but he also wasn't. Because remember when he became chief of army staff, uh he's the one that brought in mechanized infantry and things like that into India. and you could already tell because the revolution in military affairs which is the smart weapons had already started off in europe at that time europe and america at that time a visionary would have seen to not go in for armor and heavy armor formations and things like that he did not at that time he seemed visionary i think with the benefit of hindsight because now we can analyze trends you can say he was not visionary remember ultimately to sundar ji who was responsible for that horribly botched attack on the golden temple that vaidya ended up general vaidya ended up paying with his life for hmm uh vaidya was assassinated for the blunders of sundar ji hmm but sundar ji was very smart um he was a very good friend of my dad's uh genuinely smart guy genuinely dangerous guy which i loved because you need to be dangerous in order to scare your enemies uh but i think with the benefit of hindsight now no uh 
he wasn't. I think India's always, I think the last visionary we had was Shivaji, which was what, 400 years back? Yeah. I think Shivaji is the greatest Indian period. I think there is just period, no yeah, argument. Basically, yeah, yeah exactly. There's, yeah, there's no, but, uh, I mean, he's the greatest Indian. One last question and then we'll wrap it up. What's going to happen with the militias, mercenaries from the other countries that are fighting with the Ukraine? The Western, like have Western, like how I got Patani with the Ukraine. Yeah, Western, army. Western mercenaries, yeah. Well, yeah, look, I, exactly what happens with all these things when the war ends. What happened in Afghanistan? Mm -hmm. Okay. What happened in Kos uh, what what happened in uh, 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 Albania uh, when the state collapsed? Right. Mm -hmm. uh, you're going to have these heavily armed mercenary forces running around Ukraine. No mm -hmm. president of Ukraine is ever again going to be able to exercise any form of central authority, given how dangerously militarized that society has become and how dangerously militiaized mm. that society has become. So understand, even if Russia loses the war and there is a small possibility, say 15, 20% possibility that Russia will lose the war or mm -hmm. lose the will to win the war, mm -hmm. uh, the Ukraine that is left over is going to be a nightmare for its citizens. Imagine a whole bunch of Nazis and ethno-nationalists armed to the bloody teeth with guns, shoulder-fired weapons and all of that with deep, deep, deep internal divisions. Hmm. Uh, Post-war Ukraine, victorious or not, is not going to be the same as pre-war Ukraine. And pre-war Ukraine was nothing to be envious about. Post-war Ukraine is going to be positively toxic. Yeah, so I guess they have in, in inadvertently or indirectly created a Bhindranwale kind of situation for themselves yeah. in their country, right? Effectively, yeah. Exactly right. Bhindranwale LTT situation. Yeah, oh, that's that's crazy. You know, just thought of it just scares you because poor Ukrainian citizens, they're going to suffer. Anyways, Chalo, I, I, I think we'll wrap today's discussion up. That I, I enjoyed this because I, I really have a lot of respect for Francis Fukuyama and you know, when he says something, you should uh, respond to it. And the whole reason is, I think Indians should start responding to, you know, Western thinkers and 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 start responding as equals. And this is the whole reason that I, I told Abhijit that we should do this. We should opine on these things. So, as always, Abhijit, thanks for coming. It's a pleasure talking to you, buddy. Well, well, very well. Thanks. All right, guys, we'll wrap today's discussion up. Uh, once again, please subscribe to the Charvak podcast, like the video, leave your comments. And... I, I believe you should go and read Francis Fukuyama's essay. Uh, the link is there in the description of the podcast. So you can just go click on the link and read it. It's just a short 12-point uh, prediction. And please support the podcast. Uh, go follow Abhijit on Twitter. And, uh, you know, please, uh, whatever you can do, you can become a member on YouTube or on Patreon, buy the merch or send your donations directly to UPI. We'll obviously see you every Thursday on the Sham Sharma show too. Until then, uh, namaste, take care, tata. Tata.